Hi, everyone. Welcome to this session on building custom web applications with the DHIS2 app platform. Um, looks like maybe most of you were here for the last session where we talked a lot about the DHIS2 innovation ecosystem and how we're enabling that in a number of different ways. Uh, this session will be a little bit more technical about uh, how we're enabling that uh, innovation on the web app front uh, for uh, DHS2 applications that are built into the core for our own U University of Oslo core team to use that application platform, as well as for third party developers who are building customizations to DHS2 using that same platform. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that, about where we've come in the last year of development of that uh, application platform. Some of this may be review if you've been to sessions that I've done in the past about um, the, the app platform. Uh, but some of it may be new as well. Um, so please bear with me if you've if you've heard some of it before. Okay, so first I'm just going to introduce the the app platform for uh, about 45 minutes, then I'll open it up to questions. So hopefully, if you have any questions, please post them at the community of practice, there is a, uh, or there should be a, a topic for building custom web apps with the DHS2 app platform. Uh, I believe Simona will post that in the chat here on Zoom as well. Um, if you post your questions there, we'll take a look at them in the last 15 minutes of this session to answer them live here uh, as well. So uh, feel free to, to uh, ask any questions that you have along the way there. Just wanna reiterate, I posted this in the last session as well, but uh, we have a, a great resource for all of your application development needs at developers.dh2.org. Um, lots of announcements from the core team, upcoming events such as the academy that we hosted in June and August of this of 2020. Uh, and hopefully we'll have another one at the beginning of 2021. Um, as well as documentation, guides, learning materials. You can view the recordings and the slides from all of the sessions and the academies that have happened in the past as well. Um, so there's a lot of good material there. And finally, there is a link from developers.dhs2.org to a category on the community of practice specifically for application development. So if you have any questions for myself or the core team uh, on how to do something or a feature request for the, the application platform um, uh, or a use case for something that you're trying to develop on the DHS2 platform, uh, please post your questions there and we, we take a look at that pretty regularly. So where are we now? Um, this is kind of the history of the DHS2 application platform over the last year and a little bit about where we're going. Uh, I didn't get into all of the features that we've added to the application platform since it was first released. Um, some of that is covered in this, uh, in this later in this presentation, um, but this is more about what we've um, what we've accomplished and, and where the where the the project as a whole has 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 gone over the last year. So I first uh, introduced the application platform uh, at the conference annual conference last year in 2019, uh, and then that at that time it was uh, it was in development, but it was not fully released yet. Uh, in August of 2019, we released version one of that application platform and shortly thereafter ported the first core application to use the app platform in the 233 release in October of 2019. Um, we then ported four more applications to the platform in 234 release uh, earlier in 2020. And uh, then we're able to host a number of webinars with all the learnings that we had uh, accumulated and the, the features that we had developed in the platform uh, through porting those application, our, our own applications, the core applications to that platform. We're able to host uh, two webinars and two online workshops for external developers in June to August of 2020. Um, more than 120 people were at each of the webinars that were um, hosted in June and there were about 30 participants for the the two day and the four day workshops that were uh, made up the, the developer academy um, over June and August as well. Um, in the upcoming release in just a couple weeks of DHS 2.235, uh, we have five more core applications that have been ported to the app platform, including several of the large ones like the uh, dashboards application um, is now on the platform as well. So, 
this is a big uh, accomplishment for us and it's been kind of a, a pleasant surprise for the core developers to see the, the ease with which those applications can be ported and that they can um, uh, really uh, increase the uh, velocity and the maintainability of those uh, applications. Um, there's still a lot to improve and a lot of um, uh, a long ways to go there, um, but that's been a, been a great learning, I think, so far. Uh, and we're hoping to get a total of uh, 15 to 20 of the core apps ported to the app platform in the 236 release. Um, we also now have the ability to do continuous application delivery, which means that some of our applications can uh, bundled applications that are uh, in the war file of DHS 2 235 can be overwritten or overloaded with a, a new version installed from the DHS 2 app hub on apps.dhs2.org. Uh, for uh, so we can actually release some of these applications more quickly. Um, but that being said, we're still bundling uh, the core applications with the DHS2 core. So in the 236 core bundle, we hope to have a number more uh, core applications ported over uh, and some of the ones that we've already ported um, migrated to the most recent version of the platform um, as well. And then in the uh, first half of 2021, we're also hoping to have uh, nothing, nothing specific planned yet, but uh, an Android SDK and Web App Developer Academies, um, maybe combining those together, um, but definitely some more learning opportunities, either online or in person, depending on how things go, probably online at this point. Um, for the first half of 2021. So if that's something that you're interested in, please feel free to reach out and just let us know that you're interested so that we know that there's um, people out there who want to, to uh, come to these academies or workshops. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about what a DHS2 app entails. Um, I've mentioned this in the last session, so I'm not gonna go over it too much here today, but there are various layers of uh, complexity, or, or not, not necessarily complexity, but of generality of DHS2. So at the core, you have the most general and robust section of DHS2, which is the, uh, the server, the DHS2 core, which has an API, has the metadata model, has all of the resources for uh, DHS2 to function as a, as a data store. Um, and around that, we have the bundled applications that the University of Oslo develops. Uh, beyond that, you have more locally adapted custom uh, applications that are developed by uh, developers not at the University of Oslo. They might be used in only one instance or shared through the App Hub with other uh, DHS2 implementations to, uh, to, to basically adapt DHS2 for a particular use case or particular context. Uh, and then beyond that, you also have the interoperation with different uh, services and softwares um, so other, other um, tools for analyzing data or other health information systems uh, can be inter uh, interoperable with DHS2. Again, today we're going to talk about applications, specifically web applications, um, and focus on both bundled apps, so the, the applications that University of Oslo develops and maintains, as well as what we call periphery apps or third-party applications um, that are developed by probably many people on this call, um, but developers that are not uh, at, the U at the University of Oslo on the core team and applications that are not uh, bundled in the war file uh, that is deployed or released uh, every six months by DHS2. Again, this is the same um, di diagram from the last uh, presentation, but I wanted to emphasize that uh, we use the same uh, platform for our bundled applications that we expose to uh, other other app, other developers to build their applications on. So this is relatively new in the uh, DHS2 world with this the introduction of this platform is that uh, everything that is available to the core web applications, the bundled web applications should also be accessible to third party apps. Um, we still have a long ways to go to get there, but that's that's kind of the, the goal of this uh, project. So here is a picture of a single DHS2 application. In this case, it's the Data Visualizer app. It's actually a, an older screenshot of the D D Data Visualizer application. Um, but there's a lot, of, a lot of pieces, a lot of things going on here. Um, this is just an example of what, what I mean when I say uh, DHS2 web app. So 
you have the application selector in the top right when you open your DHS2 instance. There are, each of those are one of these applications or web apps. Um, we just looked at the data visualizer application. There's also the pivot tables or the maps or the dashboard application, which are all uh, analytics apps. You also have cap capture, tracker capture, um, app, uh, data entry, which are applications for collecting data and uh, in injecting it into the system, as well as some maintenance or, or core applications like uh, the maintenance app, the scheduler application, the system settings application, things like that. Um, so there's a lot of different apps that are uh, in DHS2. Many, most of the ones that you see here, actually all the ones that you see here are uh, core bundled applications, but there are also third-party applications that are installed um, to DHS2. So what's inside each one of those applications? There's a lot that's going on in, in each one of those. I'm going to go through it very quickly, but uh, for each and every application, we need to include the header bar, which has the name of the application, the name of the instance, the logo of the instance, the ability to switch to other applications, the ability to um, uh, log in and log out and see and navigate to your profile and see the number of messages that the currently logged in user has, has seen. We also need the ability to do error handling and to navigate through saved objects with a file menu, for instance to ability to uh, show dialogues for different user interface or user, um, uh, yeah, user, user experience, um, user experiences. For instance, if you say file open, it should open a dialog box that shows you the available um, objects that you can open. In addition, we have a number of things within the app itself that uh, need to, are, are fairly common. So, uh, oftentimes you'll have routing within an application to be able to navigate uh, through the URL to a specific page in that, that app or to uh, navigate to a particular saved object, for instance. Um, the ability to show alerts when something goes wrong or when, when something has happened. The ability to translate all of the English text or all of the text in your application to uh, Swahili or French or Arabic or any other language that DHS2 supports. Um, the ability to show loading and uh, error indicators when something goes wrong in a particular part of your application or when something is in the process of being loaded because sometimes that can take some time when you're on a slower network connection, for instance. Um, and then there's a number of other common UI components that are very basic, things like buttons and text boxes uh, that need to be uh, have the follow the look and feel of the DHS2 design system, which we'll get into in a little bit. Um, but you need to ad address that for each of those individual small components uh, in each application that you develop. Um, additionally, there are a few things that are specific to the application that you're developing uh, in this particular instance. So if we're talking about the data visualizer application, the ability to render a chart from a, or select a, a set of dimensions for a visualization is specific to the data visualizer app um, and needs to be done uh, there in that app as well. Uh, you have the interface for selecting different dimensions and dragging and dropping them to uh, rows or columns for a pivot table to uh, be able to manage the state of the application so that you know whether you've edited something and need to click the update button in your data visualizer application or your pivot table application, for instance. Um, that's going to be specific for, to each uh, individual app and then what its uh, target is, what its, what its intent is, um, but it needs, to be, it needs to be implemented in that application. And then under the hood, there are a number of things that e these apps need to do as well. They need to fetch read and write data. They need to get metadata schemas from the particular instance that they're talking to. They need to, to figure out where that uh, server lives. You need to do some data caching and offline support so that they're not fetching data every single time that it's requested. They need to uh, be able to authenticate uh, a, a user and show and hide different parts of the, the application if they don't, if that user doesn't have permission to see them. Uh, also needs to look through all of the source code of your application to find all of the English strings so that they can be translated. Needs to generate a manifest, needs to be able to run some tests and compile against a set of browsers that are supported by the DHS2 system. And finally, it needs to be able to build, publish, and release the uh, application to the DHS2 app hub or to install it directly to a DHS2 instance. 
Um, I've said all of this before in, in previous sessions, but uh, the, the gist is that there's a lot going on uh, and it, a lot of it is very common to all of the different applications that are in DHS2. It gets very complicated. I sent this, said this in the last session, but it gets very complicated when you have lots of different applications. So we maintain 34 applications, six libraries, four versions of those, uh, of those applications. Three of those are supported released versions and one of those is the version that we're developing next. So that's about 160 different code bases that we need to maintain as the University of Oslo to make DHIS2 function. Um, so why do we build a framework? Um, this is, uh, basically it's to address this problem, um, but on a, on a more general level, it's to make easy things easy and hard things possible. And that's a quote, uh, not a direct quote, but the quote on the screen is, easy things should be easy, hard things should be possible. It's a quote from Larry Wall, the creator of the programming language Perl. Um, and basically what we want to do is we want to make it as easy and as cost efficient and developer efficient as possible to build high quality and maintainable applications on DHIS2. There are a lot of those details that we talk about in the DHIS2, in a DHIS2 application that um, uh, that you need to think about or handle when you're when you're building a, building that app from scratch. So for instance, here are five different applications and just looking at the title bar in the browser, um, there's a lot of differences here. Um, that's because each of these applications was developed from scratch and each one had a different way to define what the name of that application was in the title bar, what the icon was for that um, application as well. Um, so you can see that these are all different. Um, and it gets you even more complex and, and confusing when you have lots of different applications. So some of these are third-party applications. Most of these are, are bundled core apps. Um, but something as small as the title and the, uh, the icon for these um, uh, individual apps shouldn't, shouldn't be something that a developer needs to worry about to make a quality DHS2 application. It should be done out of the box for them. Um, and that's what the framework is for, is to get rid of as many of those details as possible so that you can focus on what you actually care about, which is making the application do what you want to do. And you might say that uh, the title, the way the title is formatted or the, the icon that is used um, shouldn't matter to, it, it's, it's small enough that it doesn't matter, but it, do, but it does matter. And the, the reason it matters is that uh, quality and consistency is important. It makes uh, a user more comfortable and familiar with the software that they're using. And it also allows, it also could be something that's uh, small, like the format of the text here, but it has a more serious impact. For instance, it might be text that isn't translated to a different language. Um, and that's something that would have real impact on users of that system. So even though a detail is small, it doesn't mean it's not important. These are again, just a few more examples of different applications and how different they can be. So if you take a look at just the header bar of, for each of these applications, you'll see that they're each very different. And this is still the case. The, these were screenshots were taken before the application platform was starting to be implemented in a lot of these apps, but it's still the case in several apps in DHS2. And this is what we're trying to address by moving all of our applications to this platform, as well as to uh, move more and more uh, third-party applications to the platform as well. So you'll see that there's a big difference in the, uh, the, the header bar here at the top of the screen between these three different or four different applications. This third one doesn't even have a, a header bar. This is the pivot tables application, uh, which is now deprecated in favor of the data visualizer app, uh, which supports pivot tables. Um, and that is using the application platform. Um, but there's, uh, it's confusing to a user and it's hard to train a user to use a, a system that changes every time you move to a new app in that system. Uh, here's a, f a fourth one that is a, a third party application that's using different types of buttons as well as different, um, uh, different header bar. <coughs> so why do we build this framework? Why do we build the application platform? Uh, from the perspective of implementers, users, and funders. Uh, again, it's to make easy things easy and hard things possible. Um, so from, for applications that are built into DHIS2 or that are developed on this platform and deployed to DHIS2, you have more consistency across applications, which as I said, helps with training. It also helps with 
um, uh, yeah, um, professional, uh, yeah, how professional the, uh, the software is presented to the user base. Um, you get the latest features faster. This is a really big one, especially with the introduction of continuous application delivery in 235. Um, because we can move much more quickly as the core development team at the University of Oslo, we can build more features into those applications. We can make sure that those features are bug free and fix any bugs very quickly and release that to people that are on not necessarily just the latest version of the DHS2 core release, but also previous versions as well. Um, and if you're on the latest version, you don't have to wait six months until the next major release to get the, the latest features or bug fixes of an application. Um, so everything should be much more streamlined and much more uh, um, in a, easier to innovate and, and much more agile in, in the development process. Um, yeah, you can upgrade apps when you want and not before, which means less retraining. So in this case, uh, when you upload an application or when you update an application, sometimes you need to retrain all of your uh, users of that application. And that might be a big undertaking if there's a lot of changes in that app. Um, so by decoupling uh, the platform uh, from the core, we're able to uh, allow applications to be uploaded only when uh, at the time that you're, you're able to make that investment in training. Um, this is, this is uh, obviously we want to make sure that people are able to update and get the latest features and the latest bug fixes, but sometimes that's not uh, practical for an implementer or a user of a system. Um, it also in, in a more general sense allows simplification of DHS2 customization, which means that you can build these applications that extend DHS2 much more simply, much more cost effectively, uh, and without a lot of uh, investment or effort on, on the part of the local organization. Um, and finally, and I think this is the most important one, but it's at the, uh, it's at the end, uh, is you, we will be able to foster a community of more high quality applications. So by really uh, kind of taking the, the details that um, are general and general purpose across all of DHS2 applications and doing those the right way and providing those in the platform out of the box, uh, the number and the quality of the community applications on the App Hub uh, and that are shared by the community uh, will go up. And we're, we're already seeing that significantly through our academies and, and the applications that are being developed on the, using these tools. So why does it matter for developers? I imagine there are a number of developers on the call here today. Um, basically, what the app platform is, is Create React App for DHS2. It means that you get a uh, out of the box uh, application that you've uh, create from scratch that has uh, modern UI components using the DHS2 UI library, has up-to-date security and a robust data engine to be able to fetch and manage data uh, from your DHS2 instance. Uh, and it allows you to develop apps which are decoupled from DHS2 versions using the version toggling functionality that we're introducing soon uh, and worry about what rather than how. So instead of worrying about how do I build a DHS2 application, you should be worried. We, the goal is to make the, the challenge be what DHS2 application should I build? So the, the how should be self-evident and, and easy to easy to figure out using the, the building blocks that we provide uh, at the, at the, as the, the core DHS2 development team, but also through outreach programs like the academies that we're working on and the, the University of Oslo design, DHS2 design lab, which Magnus is running and has been talking, uh, it will be talking about um, tomorrow for about an hour. So what is the goal of this DHS2 application platform from a technical perspective now? Um, I said this earlier as well, but you, we want to make it cheap, fast, and easy to build custom web applications which customize the functionality of DHS2. Um, I will add to that that we also want to make it uh, easy and cost effective to maintain those applications over time. So not, once you develop it, it should continue to work. And if it doesn't continue to work, then it should be straightforward to figure out what's gone wrong and how to fix it. For instance, if you're trying to work with a new version of DHS2. 
um, their the ability to switch between multiple backend versions of DHS2 within the same application will make that maintenance cost and maintenance burden much lower. Um, and it'll also allow us to uh, yeah, kind of take things off the plate of the application developer and provide them in the platform uh, in a way that uh, will be maintained over time. Um, the second piece of this is, as, as I mentioned, uh, DHS2 core applications and third party applications are on the same playing field. So everything that we can do as the UIO core development team uh, can also in, in, the, in the near future should be able to be done by the, uh, the community as well. So when we build a core application that's powerful uh, and generic, um, the adaptation of that same application to a local context should be easy and straightforward using the uh, building blocks that we provide out of the box. How do we uh, achieve this with the app platform? I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly because I've covered it on, uh, on, on previous sessions and there's a number of materials on developers.dhs2.org that you can find to learn about this yourself. Um, but I'm gonna go through each of the, the components of the app platform and then I'll do a couple demos as well. Um, so inversion of control is the main principle of the app platform. Talked about this previously in the other section but there's a lot of different things that go on in an app. Uh, and the, the piece that's actually specific to the app that you're developing is very small, so relatively small. So it's this, this middle section here. Everything else is common across all DHS2 applications. We call that the app shell, which is a common wrapper around, uh, around the, the application specific components. Um, and this means that we're redefining what an app is. So instead of an app being a standalone web application that just happens to talk to DHS2, a DHS2 app is a DHS2 app. So it actually is a smaller component that lives in this platform in the shell that is provided by DHS2. Um, and we can do this in, in a robust and um, scalable way because we, as the DHS2 community, control the, the development ecosystem, which is the, the platform, these pro build processes and libraries that we provide, the delivery mechanism, which is, uh, that should be App Hub, I apologize. Uh, which is the App Hub uh, and the in installation of App Hub applications into the DHS2 core, uh, and the data access layer, which is the uh, DHS2 core API and the app runtime, which I'll get into in a minute. This allows us to slot in both core apps and third-party apps to a uh, the DHS2 uh, app platform shell, um, so we can much more easily swap out the, the custom secret sauce of a particular application uh, within the common shell or wrapper of the app platform. We also have unified build tooling, which basically means that we have a, a common build script for all DHS2 applications that does everything that you need in terms of transpiling your code, making sure that it runs against certain browsers, uh, generating translation strings and injecting those into the application. Uh, and putting that application into the shell of wrapper that uh, will actually create the full, full blown web application at the end. What does this actually look like? So this is an abbreviated version of a package.json file for a, a DHS2 core application. Um, I took out all of the things that are specific to this particular app, which happens to be the maps application, but um, this, these are just the, basically the dependencies that were, are replaced by the platform. So instead of all of this and a lot of complexity that we then have to multiply by 34 times times four for different supported versions. So we have 160 versions of all of this uh, dependency mess. Um, we have this. So this is the same, more or less the same functionality as was in this a uh, giant mess of a package of JSON file in just two, effectively two or three dependencies. So we still have React, but we also have um, the, the build tools, the common runtime, and the U UI library that allows us to have co modern and standardized components. And I'll get into what the, each of these pieces do in just a minute. So the, the app scripts, which is that uh, standard build tooling, allows you to run a development server of your application. 
It allows you to build a production version of that application. It allows you to run tests on your application. It also allows you to, uh, from the command line, deploy directly to a DHS2 instance. So you can run uh, the build script and then the deploy script, and I'll demonstrate this in a, in a couple minutes, and that will uh, immediately deploy it to a running DHIS2 instance somewhere in the world. Um, this is uh, a lot more um, time efficient and a lot is also much more friendly to continuous integration environments to be able to de develop your application and immediately deploy it to a running DHIS2 instance. And soon we'll be having, uh, we'll be adding the ability to publish to the DHS2 app hub from the command line as well. So that you can uh, automate the, and, and kind of streamline the, uh, the process that your application goes through uh, to get to the app hub. Um, this app scripts does a lot of other things as well um, that we've mentioned in the past in that um, big diagram of the different pieces of, a, uh, of an application. Um, and I've listed them here as well. Uh, we also have a, a new configuration file, which is configuration specific to DHIS2. Uh, the name at the top here is uh, becomes the URL where your application is hosted in a DHIS2 instance. Um, so you will end up having your application installed at uh, the your your base URL for your DHIS2 instance slash API slash apps slash simple dash app. The title that will then show up in the both the application menu as well as in the header bar when you open that application will be what's defined as title here. So simple example app. Uh, and then the description will show up in various places in the UI as well. Um, the final thing that we configure here is the, the entry point of this application, which is just an exported React component. Uh, so there's no need to have any Webpack or Babel build scripts or do any, any magic around figuring out where a DHS2 server is located or anything like that. Um, this is a fairly simple configuration file. Uh, there are some other configuration options that you can use as well for more advanced use cases, but I won't get into those today. Um, and then the second piece here, we talked about unified build tooling and the scripts that are exposed by the, the platform. Now we'll talk about the runtime that is exposed by the platform. So this are uh, services and features of DHIS2 that you can access while your application is running. Um, this is the app runtime uh, dependency. It's published on NPM uh, and it has a number of different things that are uh, included here. Um, the UI primitives at the top there, that actually comes from the second dependency here, which is DHIS2 slash UI. That is not included in app runtime. Um, but the rest of these are uh, kind of out of the box provided by the platform. Uh, you have data fetching, translations, configuration, server discovery, and authentication. And soon we'll be having some very cool um, new features coming along uh, standardized loading and error handling for applications, standardized routing to be able to uh, develop uh, history routing without having any uh, without including any external dependencies, it'll just be baked into the platform. Uh, alerting as well as data caching and offline support with service workers. So that will be coming, um, most of those will be coming in the next six months. Uh, you don't have specific dates for when those will be coming to the platform, but look, look for those coming soon as well. I mentioned the design system and the, the UI components that are uh, exposed by this DHIS2 slash UI. Um, uh, dependency and the, you can learn more about that on the documentation website so you can all of this is linked from developers at dhs2.org you have uh, a very sophisticated design system that's developed by the uh, dhs2 designer uh, Joe here at the University of Oslo and uh, this has everything that you would possibly want to know about how a dhs2 application should look and feel um, everything from how much space you should put between text and a button to uh, how you dis, uh, convey the concept of depth and layering to a user when you have things like um, modal dialogues and alert bars and uh, different navigation elements in a DHS2 application. So that has kind of a theoretical introduction to what the, the rules of design in the DHS2 world are. And then we have 
a DHS2 slash UI. Uh, oh, this is the wrong URL. Apologize for that. Um, I will fix that right now. Um, the, we have a UI library as well, which has exposes a number of reusable components that automatically adopt that design system. So this button uses the uh, the system that you uh, that was designed by Joe, and uh, it allows you to put that standardized DHIS2 button into your application. And it has many, many different components from things like text boxes to alert bars to uh, the org unit tree to a transfer component for being able to select from a large set of options. Um, for instance, that's used in the data visualizer application. There's a lot of uh, components in this UI uh, library and there's more and more added all the time. Finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about declarativity, which I've talked about before. Um, basically, for uh, both configuration of applications as well as flow of data in a DHS2 application, uh, we want to care about how rather than, or sorry, what rather than how. Uh, again, uh, that's one of the principles of the, the platform. Um, so, what is some what is declarative, and what is the opposite of declarative? Uh, as an example of that, a destination is something that's declarative. Um, so I can give you the name of this boulangerie in Paris but, uh, and the location of it, but I'm not telling you how to get there. I'm just telling you that that is the destination of where you want to go. Uh, if instead I gave you turn by turn directions of how you would walk from where you are now to that boulangerie in Paris, then you would uh, be, I would be telling you how to get there, and that's what's called imperative rather than declarative. Um, there are a number of advantages to declarativity over imperativity uh, or declarative over imperative paradigms. Um, uh, I'm not going to get into too many of the, the advantages here, but one of the main ones is that uh, this uh, application can declare what it wants. So it can make a, send a query to the app shell or the data engine uh, in, the, in the app runtime. And that app shell or that, uh, that engine can then say, all right, I know what you want. I'm going to figure out how to get it. So it might be that I already have fetched that information or some part of that information from the server previously in the same session. Maybe I have it stored in an offline cache. Uh, I can look that up locally and, and return that to you directly. Maybe I don't have it yet and I can need to actually go and send a request across the network to get that from the DHIS2 server, uh, wait for that to come back and then send it to you. Um, so this allows the, the application to be built in a way that doesn't care where that data is coming from or how it's being fetched. Uh, and then you can actually decouple all of your components as well. So if you have 10 different components that need the same data, rather than needing to feed it to a central state system and then uh, wire it down into the individual components that need it and maintain the state of that, um, uh, that data in a central location, the, the app shell or the app platform can do that for you. And each of those components can be developed independently and then can be reused across applications as well in, in places that might not have that same centralized uh, state store. Um, I'm, again, I'm not going to get too much into the, the technical details of why this is, why this is good and important, um, but this is how we've developed our uh, application runtime uh, data engine, which I'll talk about here in a minute. So without the app runtime, without the data engine, this is the code that you would need to write uh, in, and this is using React and using hooks. So it's actually already much cleaner than if you were doing this with component-based React or another, um, another library. Uh, but this is how you need to manage fetching data from a DHS2 instance. You need to, cert you need to uh, figure out some way to get the base URL of that instance, which in this case is hard-coded as localhost 8080, but that's not going to be the case in when you actually deploy your application somewhere. You then need to fetch the data, wait for it to come back, uh, show a loading indicator while something is happening, uh, show an error if an error occurs, and finally render the data if it comes back um, correctly. Uh, this is actually abbreviated, so you would actually need more if you wanted to be um, catch all of the, dif the different cases that might happen when you're fetching data in this way. So this is the imperative version of fetching data in React uh, from a DHS2 instance. 
now we can do the exact same thing in a declarative way with the data engine and the data query. Uh, basically, the query object here tells the engine that it wants to fetch a list of indicators. Uh, or actually, it wants to fetch a single indicator, which is defined by an ID. I'm not going to get into the details of how this works or how you pass variables to a, a query here. You can find a lot of information about that, um, particularly in the second workshop, which is on developers at teachers2.org. There's lots of recordings and slides from those sessions that you can look at, as well as some uh, example um, uh, exercises to, to test your knowledge and to, to play around with as well. Um, but this basically just tells the data engine that it wants to get the indicator with a specific ID and doesn't care how that indicator is fetched. Um, the, the data engine then takes care of actually going and finding that information, figuring out if it stored locally or if it needs to get fetched from across the network, uh, sending the signal that the, the current state is loading or the current state is an error or the current state is success and data has been returned. Uh, and then the, the component only needs to deal with those states and, and render the, the proper thing. So it's much simpler than the imperative version of the same thing. So I just introduced the concept of queries um, and mutations. Um, it may seem a little bit strange and, and different. Um, it's very similar to uh, GraphQL, which uh, some people might be familiar with. Um, but uh, we also have built a tool that specifically lets you test uh, and explore the DHS2 API using these queries and mutations, which I didn't get into, but I'll talk about in a minute as well. So I'm going to go ahead and show that to you here. So you should see here now uh, a, a, a website that's DHS2, runtime.dhs2.nu slash playground. You can also find this by going to developers.dhs2.org clicking on the docs page, clicking on app runtime. And then on the left here, there's a button for query playground. So we're going to go ahead and open that up. Uh, I'm going to put in the URL of a DHS2 instance that I want to test. Uh, you will have to note that this does need to be uh, in the cores whitelist of that particular instance. Um, so if you're using the, the standalone uh, hosted version of this playground, you'll need to do some configuration of your browser as well as the, the instance to be able to use it. Um, but this is also, this, this application is also available in the uh, App Hub. So you can install it directly to your, your instance. So I'm actually gonna go ahead and do that. So I'm gonna go to a DHS2 instance that I have running. I'm gonna log in. And I'm gonna show you I'm going to go to the app management app or go to the app hub. Uh, and now if I search in here, I should see query playground. So data query playground by DHS2 and install the latest version. It's actually all already installed, but I'm reinstalling it here. So you can see that this installs that, that playground to your local instance. I'm then going to open that application. Uh, and this is the, the playground that we have provided here. So, what this does is on the left side here, you have a number of tabs that might be open or might not be open um, that show uh, different queries and the, uh, that could also be mutations. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and run this query, which is fetching the me resource from the API. Uh, and then it will go ahead and fetch that from the local server. Uh, and it will show you the resu result here on the right hand side. If I go back to the, the hosted version, I wanted to show the one that's installed to a local instance because uh, that's probably a, a better way to test against your local instance. Um, but I'm gonna show you now the standalone version because I have a number of um, tabs already saved that we'll, that we'll see. Big shout out to my colleague Jan Gerke who added the ability to have tabs and to save these uh, queries on the left hand side uh, in local storage. So you'll see that I open this up and I already have three tabs open um, because it remembers that uh, I had these, these queries previously and I might want to use them again. Um, and this is specific to the instance that I logged into. So if you logged into a different instance, it would have a different set of tabs saved as well. 
So let's go ahead and fetch. Now we're going to get the, the list of all the indicators in this um, instance. We're going to get uh, set at a page size of 20 and we're going to get the third page. So this is going to be indicators number 41 through 60 um, of this uh, particular instance. We're going to get a couple fields, the display name, numerator, denominator, and the ID and display name of the user for this particular instance. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and click execute and get that result on the right hand side. So this is a really cool way to uh, explore the API. Um, you can run any API query uh, on the left side here and get the results on the right. Uh, you can also, again, as I said, save those queries and run them uh, when you want to. So now we're going to get the same thing that we saw before, which is the name of the current user. Uh, we can also do a mutation. So if we saw in this uh, the name of this current user, we have hello world with two exclamation points as the introduction. Um, now I'm going to create a mutation. So I've selected mutation down at the bottom left of this uh, playground. Um, I've selected the resource me. I'm going to update that uh, resource and I'm going to tell it uh, hello world uh, is no longer the introduction. Instead, I'm going to say bonjour. Um, I can then click execute. If I then go back to this tab with me and I execute again, you can see that the introduction was actually updated by that mutation. So this is making behind the scenes a put request or post request depending um, to change that resource. Um, there's a lot more information, like I said, about this on developers.dhs2.org. Oops. Developers of DHS2.org in the documentation section under app runtime. There's a lot more documentation about how to use this use data query hook, the different options that are available, how to construct a query. And you can also find on the events tab, if you go to the, uh, the platform or the, let's go ahead and do the uh, Developer Academy Workshop 2. You can find all of the session recordings from that workshop here. Uh, advanced data queries would be a good one for uh, more advanced use cases of DHS2 application uh, runtime. Okay, um, getting close to the end of time here, so I'm going to go back into my presentation. Um, Um, again, this is the, the standardized lifecycle of an application that we uh, enable with this platform. So you can build your application, you then publish it to the App Hub, and then can install it to a DHS2 production instance, but that's not all. You can also run tests on your local application, and this is, this is quite powerful, I think. Uh, using the D2 CLI, which is a command line interface for, for uh, DHS2, you can actually create and spin up different versions of DHIS2, running those locally in Docker with just single command on the local machine. And then you can test your application against that, uh, all of those different versions of DHIS2. Um, maybe it's only one initially, but you, you still want to test your application against a running version of DHIS2, but you don't want to use the production version you can uh, go ahead and, and test against a local Docker instance if you have that capability. Uh, you can also run uh, local unit tests with Jest automatically with the platform. There's a test command in, in the scripts for D, uh, the, the application platform as well. Uh, and then the other uh, new line here in the bottom right is the ability to deploy directly to a production instance. As I mentioned, uh, you can create a DHS2 application run uh, app scripts deploy, and it will install that instance directly to, or that application directly to a DHS2 instance. Again, uh, find lots of resources on this, uh, developers.dhs2.org and the community of practice, and we continually update those. Um, so look for more information. Um, I'm going to go ahead and open it up for questions. I wanted to do a quick demo of uh, creating a new application and deploying it to an instance. Uh, but I think we're running pretty short on time. So I'm going to open it up for questions now. And if there aren't too many questions, I will do that demo. Um, let me see if I can find this. Uh, 
Uh, that's a good question um, from Farai here. Um, so yes, you can, and this this is what I was was hoping to demonstrate. Um, I will share. Actually, I'm going to share a different window. Let's share. Um, share a different window here. So this is just a uh, a terminal um, where I have uh, a let's let's say I have a local DHS two application. So. Um, This is a local DHS2 application. Um, I have the, the latest version, so I'm just gonna make sure that I have the latest version of this uh, CLI app scripts application. Oops, scripts. Uh, I'm able to do this from the command line. So I can build this application and then I can also deploy it directly to an application from the command line. But as uh, Farai mentioned here, you can definitely um, you, you can definitely also upload that application manually. Uh, so I'll show that in a minute as well. But that is also possible. You can use the app management app to upload the zip file that's generated by the app platform. Um, I'll show that in a minute while this is installing the the version of the the platform. Um, the Next question here is how much code of app runtime is reusable in React Native? Um, it's a very good question. I have, we have not actually officially supported React Native at this time. Um, there is, the majority of the app runtime code is not React specific. So the, the data engine specifically, I guess. Uh, so the engine itself is, uh, is not, doesn't have any React. It doesn't actually have any dependencies at all. It's just JavaScript. So that should be able to run very easily in React Native. We would need a different wrapper potentially to expose that to React Native. Um, right now we only have a React um, uh, wrapper for that engine. Um, but that's definitely something that would be a good feature request if that's um, something that you're interested in using um, this for. We don't have any uh, core applications that use React Native at this time. Uh, another question was, does the CLI support TypeScript? Uh, the answer is yes, it does. We don't generally use that for most of our applications. We uh, use TypeScript for uh, the app runtime specifically in a kind of narrow use case for type safety in that uh, heavily utilized um, library. Um, and that is built with the platform as well. So the CLI, the platform CLI supports both building libraries and building applications, and it does support TypeScript out of the box. You can also uh, customize it with different Babel plugins if you want to use flow types, for instance, uh, which we do in one, one application. Um, does the app runtime as presented support all API, web API resources, or at least all the commonly used ones? Yes, it should. If you find any that it does not support, uh, we would like to make sure that it does support them. Uh, but as far as we know, everyone, uh, every endpoint, um, a web API endpoint should be supported by that app platform or the app runtime. Um, I'm going to go ahead and finish up here. So I've installed the latest version of the CLI app scripts. Um, I have, as I mentioned, uh, an application running locally. You can see the d2.config.js, which has just a type of an application and it points to an entry point. I can run yarn build, which under the hood does d2 app scripts build, as you can see there. Uh, so it actually is going to now build a production artifact that is installable to a DHS2 instance. It generates all of the translations for this application, builds the application, builds the app shell that wraps around that app with the application inside of it. And then in about 30 seconds, should see, uh, it actually should be faster than this, but my computer is going very slowly today. Um, it builds a, an archive, so a .zip file that, that, that you can then immediately upload to a DHS2 instance. So you could manually upload this zip file to the app management app in your instance, for instance. Uh -huh. um, so if I go to the app management app, um, and maybe you can't see my screen, so I'm going to share just the whole desktop now. 
So in this app management app that you can see here, uh, you could click upload and then select the zip file and uh, upload that, that was generated by that build. Um, now, if we look at the, um, uh, this, so this was generated the zip file. We can also run yarn deploy. Oops. Oh, sorry, yarn, yarn deploy is not defined. So I actually need to put that into the scripts for my application. It is uh, available here, but I hadn't defined it as a script yet. So now if I go to yarn deploy, it will run the deploy script where it will ask me for a instance URL. I'm gonna put in the one that I was using before. It asks me for a username and password for a user that is able to install applications to that instance. Um, ah, I apologize, I made a mistake because it is not an HTTPS. It should be if you're using a production instance, but this is not a production instance. Anyway, we, we need to wrap up here, but I will keep doing this while I talk um, and hopefully not make any more mistakes. Um, I will go ahead and go through the, uh, I mistyped the password, apologies. Uh, but you should be able to uh, immediately upload the application directly from this instance here. Um, I will go through the rest of the questions that were posted on the community of practice after this session to answer them there. Um, if you have any more questions, feel free to post them on that, that, uh, that topic in the community of practice. And I will do this correctly this time. So now we are able to actually upload the application to d2.wings.tech. Uh, I go back here, reload the app management app, and you can see that this application has been installed to this uh, running instance uh, from the command line. So that is just a demonstration of the deploy command. We are out of time, unfortunately, here today. Um, thank you all very much again for, for joining me. And um, if you have any questions, post them on the community of practice, that topic that was started, and I will answer them asynchronously after this. Um, if you stay on this session, uh, you should see the, uh, a, a, a great, sec um, a great uh, topic by a number of my colleagues um, uh, that is coming up next about scripting custom forms. So looking forward to seeing that myself and uh, thank you everyone for joining.